study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And what is the word of truth? It is God's word. All 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. Hello, saints. Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Have you ever heard the saying, let's agree to disagree? That's okay if we're talking about liver and onions, but it's not such a good idea if you're talking about God's Word. Because there's only one interpretation of God's Word, and that's the right interpretation. Or maybe this one. Maybe you've heard this one. It's not a, a salvation issue, so it really doesn't matter. Oh, really? I think it really does matter, especially when 90% of Christians today are unsure about their own salvation in Christ Jesus. It really does matter. These things all sound good, but are they based on God's Word? Or are they based on man's traditions? Or even worse, are they the words of the enemy himself? Remember how he deceived Eve in the garden, twisting God's words? Remember that? Our Apostle Paul sets an example for the body of Christ to follow today. In fact, here's exactly what Paul says about man's traditions versus the gospel for today. In Galatians 1.9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be spoiled by philosophy or vain deceit and traditions of men that are only going to lead me to be accursed. That doesn't sound too good to me. Thankfully, I was, I was actually led to the head of the snake while researching for this study, and you're not going to believe where the phrase, Bride of Christ, actually comes from. I was, ex I was shocked when I found this information, and you're probably going to be just as shocked as I was. This information puts a whole new spin on the name Bride of Christ and who it is. So buckle up and hold on tight. Now, in order to answer any question we might have concerning God's Word, we always have to use a, a formula, right? And the formula is our foundation to understanding the Bible. First thing we need to do is use the King James Version Bible. We need to make a stand on using one Bible, the King James Version Bible. Second, we need to rightly divide by asking who, what, where, why, how, those types of things. And third, we need to apply dispensational understanding to whatever topic we're asking questions about. Now, in this instance, we're asking a question, who is the bride? Who's the woman? Who's the virgin? Does the Bible teach that the body of Christ is also the bride of Christ. The first thing we need to do is approach this through the eyes of right division. That's part of our formula. It's our foundation. Now, looking at the chart in front of you, we see the dispensational program for the nation of Israel. The prophetic program from Genesis all the way to Revelation. What we don't see here, however, is our, this, our program, our dispensation, the gospel of grace, the apostle Paul. There's 2,000 years of grace here that's been removed on purpose, okay, to make a, a, a point, an illustration. So keeping that in mind, that this chart in front of you only consists of the prophetic program for the nation of Israel. It, this has nothing to do with the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with us today, this chart, okay? So we ask the question, can we see the woman, the bride, in this program in front of us? Is she seen here in the prophetic program for the nation of Israel? 
We know by right division, by understanding dispensations, that the only place the body of Christ is found is in Paul's 13 books, Romans through Philemon. And I've removed that part from the 66 books of the Bible here in this illustration in front of you. So, can we find scripture outside of Paul's 13 books, Romans through Philemon, that talk about a bride, that talk about a woman, that talk about a virgin, and so on? Let's see what we can find in the Old Testament in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the final books of the Bible, Hebrews through Revelation. All those books are outside of what Paul wrote, right? Let's begin in Isaiah 54, Old Testament. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy wood widowhood any more. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Isaiah 62, verse 3. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hezebah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. You see, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3, in verse 1, they say, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's wife, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. In verse 11, And the Lord said unto me, That backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. In verse 20, Surely, as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Now, everything we've been reading is about God and his relationship with Israel. Clearly, he displays himself as the husband and Israel as the wife, the woman, the 
in, in this particular case, she was a harlot, okay? And he calls her a harlot and divorces her, divorces the land of Israel because she was cheating on him with other gods. They were worshiping idols. And God doesn't like idols, right? Verse 21, a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Let's look at Jeremiah 31. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built. O virgin of Israel, thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenants that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. God is calling them the wife. He's calling himself the husband. A wife is a female. She's a woman. She also was a virgin, right? 33. But this shall be the covenant that I make with, uh, I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Ezekiel 16, verse 30. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou dost all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. God is calling the nation of Israel a whorish woman because earlier I explained to you how she was worshiping idols and other gods. She went a whoring from her true husband, our Lord God. In verse 31, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makes makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as a harlot, in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. Again, God is very upset here. He's calling the nation of Israel an adulteress, a whore, that went out a whoring after different gods, right? So again, so far, so far into this study, it's clear the nation of Israel in the Old Testament is the woman, is the bride, is the virgin. And unfortunately, because she worshipped other gods, she was called a whore. In Hosea, Hosea 2, verse 1, Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to his sisters, Rahama, plead with your mother, plead. For she is not my wife. Now here in this passage, if you go read it yourself in Hosea, it is a uh, comparison between God and Israel and a man and his wife. Okay, he has children with his wife. And each name of those children, like Ami and Loami and that, it means a certain thing, right? And they're not good things. I'll tell you that right now. But go study it. Look into it. But here in this passage, we're seeing a relationship between God and the nation of Israel. In verse 2, plead with your mother, that would be the nation of Israel, plead for she, okay, that would be Israel, is not my wife, again, the wife, Israel, neither am I her husband, right? 
God here, he's speaking here. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children for they be the children of whoredoms. Verse 7, And she shall follow after her lovers. She here is Israel, once again, but she shall not overtake them, and shall she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband. You see, this is a, a picture of when Israel returns back to God, her first husband. For then was it better with me than now. Joel 1 verse 6. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Right? What's that saying? Lament like a virgin girded. He's talking about Israel with sackcloth for her husband when she was younger. But now, you see, she went whoring. She, went, she strayed from her husband. And here in this passage, God is saying, come back to me as it was in the beginning. I will restore everything. Just come back to me. And this has been going on for 2,000 years now. In Joel 2, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. This is talking about the day of the Lord. This is talking about after Daniel's 70th week. For it is nigh at hand, right? A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a, str and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck breasts, let the bridegroom, okay, this would be Jesus, go forth of his chamber, the chamber is heaven, Jesus coming down from heaven, and the bride out of her closet. Who is this bride, and what is this closet that we're talking about? Notice in that verse 16, it says, Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and let the bride out of her closet. So, the bridegroom and the bride coming out of her closet. Well, let's find out exactly what's going on here. We go back to Isaiah 26 to understand this passage in verse 16. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in the sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead come my people enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed for behold the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So it's clear that the bride is the protected remnant of Israel who's hidden during Daniel's 70th week. 
And we see that go, going back to Joel 2, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. First, we see the bride go into hiding during the tribulation, Daniel 70th week. Then we see the bridegroom coming at the end of that Daniel 70th week. And the bride, then she comes out of the closet, comes out of hiding to meet the bridegroom, who to meet our Lord Jesus at his second coming. By rightly dividing, it's clear that the remaining Jewish believers on earth waiting for Jesus at the second coming is the bride. Now, we go back to all the way back to 1450 BC. Israel becomes God's wife after she leaves Egypt. We see that in Ezekiel 16.8. It portrays the covenant made between God and Israel at Mount Sinai as a marriage covenant. In the late 700s BC, Israel is a virgin in the book of Amos, Amos 5.2. Again, about 700 BC, Jerusalem, also called Zion, is a daughter. You can read that in Micah 4.8. And again, in about 700 BC, the prophet Hosea shows Israel as acknowledging having once been God's wife. But now she became a whore because she was worshiping other gods. You can read that in Hosea 2.7. There is a future time coming when Israel will again be a faithful wife. This is the prophesied future. Daniel 70th week and the second coming. You can see that in Hosea 2.16. Hosea also portrays Israel as a mother in Hosea 2.2. And again, in 700 BC, Israel is called a wife, God's wife, in Isaiah 54, 6. And in 600 BC, Jeremiah shows God's people as engaged or espoused to God in Jeremiah 2, 2. A wife in Jeremiah 3, 14. A virgin daughter in Jeremiah 14, 7. And a virgin in Jeremiah 18, 13, 31, and 4, and chapter 21. The reason why I'm telling you all these books, chapters, and verses, so you can pause the video and you can open up your King James Version Bible and you can go look at it for yourself. About 595 to 570 BC, Ezekiel portrays Israel through her history from Sinai as an adulterous wife. And that can be found in Ezekiel 16, 32, 23, verse 4. So, let's look in the New Testament now. We looked in the Old Testament, and it's clear Israel is seen as the wife, the virgin, the bride, the daughter, and so on. What about the New Testament? Can we see a bridegroom in the New Testament? Can we see a bride in the New Testament? Well, let's find out. In, Re in Revelation chapter 4, I mean, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 12, in verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman... This is Israel, the nation of Israel, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. The 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Jacob, right? And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Okay, so we see a woman here in Revelation 12 and we, that is the nation of Israel. It's not the body of Christ. Again, keep in mind, everything that we've just heard in this video up until now and for the next couple minutes is outside of the 2,000 year period that we're in right now. Everything we've been talking about is outside of Paul's books, Romans through Philemon. Paul's books are not in here. We're not in here yet. There's going to be some scripture coming up that is going to be Paul's and I'll make sure I tell you that. But everything we've just discussed thus far is outside of our program, the mystery gospel, the gospel of grace, the 2000 year period. So this woman, this bride, this virgin, Israel, the nation Israel, has been found outside of Paul's books. That's my point. Matthew 9, 15. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn? 
as long as the bridegroom is with them. He's saying, I am with you. Jesus is calling himself the bridegroom here. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. He was caught up to heaven, right? After his crucifixion. And then shall they fast. Matthew 22. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. He's talking about God the Father, which made a marriage for his son. He's talking about himself, Jesus. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. So what is this wedding? You see, God the King sending his son Jesus to find guests for the wedding. Right? Well, what is, it, what is this wedding all about? Jesus is the bridegroom. He's going to marry someone. And again, we're in the book of Matthew. We're talking about the nation of Israel. Nowhere is the body of Christ here yet. Paul's not around yet. So obviously the wife here is the nation of Israel. All right? That's the context. Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto, what? Ten virgins. These are Jews. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. There's Jesus. And five of them were wise. Five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps. Okay, we know the rest of the story. This is the parable of the virgins. All the way down to verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. This is Jesus coming back at the second coming. And he goes out to meet them. The, the nation of Israel, the Jews, some of them will have faith plus works, plus, which equal fruit, okay? They'll have faith and their fruit to show their faith. These are the, the wise virgins. The foolish virgins say they have faith, but they have no proof of it. They have no fruit. These are the foolish virgins. Some will go into the earthly kingdom. Some will not go into the earthly kingdom. They'll be removed from the earth. They'll be destroyed. Galatians 4, 26. Now we get into Paul's gospels here. Galatians 4, 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul is calling Jerusalem his mother. And we saw that all throughout the Old Testament. Jerusalem is the Israel. This is the woman. Jerusalem is the woman, the bride. That's her. And Paul says, But Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul is speaking of the mother of the nation of Israel, the Jewish nation, Jerusalem. Paul calls Jerusalem his mother. So if she's the mother, then who's the father? Well, God is the father. Jerusalem is the mother, which would make them husband and wife. We see the woman here, the wife, the bride. Galatians 4.27 again. Here's Paul. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that, that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Paul here is writing about a passage in Isaiah. Look at the first part of this. Galatians 4.27 For it is written. Okay? That means Paul is talking about an Old Testament passage. And he's reminding them of what it said. And he's quoting Isaiah 54. So Isaiah 54 verse 1 Sing, O barren, thou, Israel, that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Verse 4 Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is, who? Thine husband. God just says, I am your husband. And he's speaking to Jerusalem, the woman. 
the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith God, thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee. Okay, God is saying, for a moment, we're not in agreement. They had a big argument because she was chasing other gods. And she has partially been made blind for 2,000 years. For a moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. He's talking about gathering the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. This is when they're hidden and protected during Daniel's 70th week. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. So, in Galatians 4, it's clear here that Paul knows perfectly well who the woman, who the bride is. And he points back to Isaiah 54. He calls her the mother of us all. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Who's this wife again? It is the nation of Israel. The marriage of the Lamb is at the second coming. I have a video all about the marriage supper of the Lamb and what it is and what it's not. Okay, It's talking about the second coming when we see the woman here, the nation of Israel, being married to the bridegroom who is Jesus. And if you remember, remember a familiar passage, it says, uh, Blessed are they who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, yes, they are blessed. These are the believing Jews, the remnant that was protected during the 70th week of Daniel, and they meet their bridegroom at the end, at the second coming. So they are blessed. The other half is not going to be so blessed because the angels are going to remove them from the earth. All right, In verse 9, uh, in verse 8, And to her, Israel, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Keep in mind, we're talking about scripture here by rightly dividing, understanding dispensations. This scripture we're dealing with right now has nothing to do with the body of Christ. It is outside of Paul's books. This is talking about the woman, the bride, the virgin, which we already know is Israel, the nation of Israel. In Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is Jerusalem. Remember, we talked about Jerusalem earlier. And it was clear who she was. She is of the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel. This is the wife that God is going to be reconciled with at the end. This is the new Jerusalem coming down. New Jerusalem indicates this is a reconciled marriage, right? Things are about to get much better at that point. Adorned for her husband. The husband is, is God. Revelation 21 verse 9 and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come hither I will show thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the what holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God right Revelation 22 17 and the spirit and the bride say come and let him that heareth say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely a big part of understanding the bible is also having a good understanding of english composition knowing the difference between parables and fables for example, and knowing the difference between a simile and a metaphor is very important when you read the Bible. And in this case, in order to understand the information coming up, you're going to need a good understanding of what a simile is and what a metaphor is. Let's look at a simile real, real quick. 
a simile, an explicit likening of one thing to another. A figure of speech in which two essentially unlike things are compared. And the comparison being made explicit typically by the use of the introductory words like or as. A metaphor, a figure of speech by which a thing is spoken of as being that which is only resembles as when a ferocious man is called a tiger. A figure of speech in which a term is transferred from the object it ordinarily designates to an object it may designate only by implicit comparison or analogy, as in the phrase evening of life. So, in the upcoming verses, we're going to see examples of similes that Paul uses in order to understand the context of what Paul writes. You're going to need to know what a simile is in the first place. Now, you know it's, it's so true, and, and God says in his word, in Hosea 4 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge I will also reject thee that thou shalt be no priest to me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God I will also forget thy children so it is so true God says in his word Hosea 4 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge if you do not understand basic English metaphors similes uh, if you don't understand what else did we mention earlier if you don't understand parables versus fables and so on then you're gonna have a hard time understanding the Bible because every period every comma every every exclamation point every semicolon mean something in the King James Version Bible. It really does. And if you skip over any one of those things, it can change the entire context of the verse. So it is true. People are destroyed for lack of knowledge today. And it's sad. And in some cases, you know, knowledge is, is intentionally being withheld from the body of Christ to keep us confused and un under religious bondage. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11.2. Remember, keep in mind what a simile is. Using the words like or as and so forth. 2 Corinthians 11.2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In Ephesians 5, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is, at, is the head of the church. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. These are all similes. For no man, verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it even as the Lord the church. So, why all the confusion? Why do many people in Christendom call the body of Christ the bride of Christ? Well, there's basically five reasons for that. Number one, the new versions of the Bible, some of them use the word bride in Paul's epistles. The King James Version Bible has no such thing. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11.2 in the RSV, I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to Christ to present you as a pure bride to her one husband. 2 Corinthians again, 11.2, the NLT, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself, I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Not understanding similes and not using the King James Version Bible, you, it can throw you completely off completely off 
all right and it can confuse you the second reason is misunderstanding again the similes and metaphors in those three verses that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 Romans 7 2 Corinthians 11 not and third not knowing the origins of the phrase bride of Christ a certain religious group who coined that phrase bride of Christ and applied it to their church system number four lack of right division not knowing how the Bible is written according to dispensations and traditions being taught over and over again until it's accepted as being true the fifth reason to push a religious agenda example of that is replacement theology teaching that the body of Christ replace replaces the nation of Israel and if you call the body of Christ the bride of Christ then what you're saying is that the body of Christ is Israel okay so the most common reason is in fact an incorrect reading of Paul's books in Ephesians Romans and Corinthians let's take a look at those real quick because these are where the problems lie in Ephesians 5 here Paul is exhorting the believers on how we should act in the world, okay? Things we should avoid and things we should pay attention to. Ephesians 5 verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart toward to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God it says verse 22 wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord verse 23 for the husband is the head of the wife look at the next words even as that's a simile Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives even as here's a simile again Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself Nowhere in that passage does it say we are the bride of Christ. It's clear by reading this passage and understanding what a simile is that Paul is comparing the relationship of a husband and wife to the relationship between the church and Christ Jesus. The focus here, the context, is comparing the quality of relationship between husband and wife and how they're to treat each other it really takes a lot of twisting and some mental gymnastics here to say that that passage is proof that we're the bride of Christ completely out of context to what Paul is actually saying and we've already seen by rightly dividing who the wife really is it's all over the New Testament it's all over the four Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John and it's all over the end time books in the books of Hebrews through Revelation Okay, so on to our next most understood verse in Romans 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Okay, that's, that's big. You need to understand what, what I just said. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to who? Who's Paul speaking to here? Those that know the law, the Jews, right? How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loosed from the law of her husband so then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress but if her husband be dead she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man wherefore my brethren 
ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we shall bring forth fruit unto God. So the context of that passage is how Christ Jesus freed believers from the law, no longer obligated under the law, just like a wife's obligation to her husband, right? The first thing we need to notice here is who Paul is speaking to again, those under the law. These are Jews. Paul goes on to explain, as long as she's married and he's living, she's bound under the law to stay faithful to her husband. But if her husband dies, then she's free from that commitment and she's free to remarry. She's no longer bound under the law of marriage. So before Christ Jesus died on the cross, the world was bound under the commitment of law. The Jews were under the law. After Christ Jesus' crucifixion, the law was put to death, just like a husband would be put to death, releasing us from the commitment of the law. No more obligation under the laws of Moses. Once again, this passage does not say we're married to Jesus or that we're his bride, his wife, etc. Paul is using the, the law relationship of a husband and wife to explain why the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus releases us from being under the law, the bondage. Our next verse, 2 Corinthians 11. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you, here's a simile again, as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Again, once again here, there's no terminology there calling us the bride of Christ. Here, again, we see the simile in play. Paul is comparing the purity of a chaste virgin to how we should be spiritually pure. The purity is the context here, not the church being a bride. Paul, Paul's exhorting them here once again, warning them about the false religious system that would corrupt them if they didn't pay attention. And he uses the example of how Satan tricked Eve into sin, right? So we've gone over the top three passages that are taught out of context, leading people to believe in lies and traditions and, and you know, flat out believing in another gospel. This is exactly what happens when you don't rightly divide God's word. When you don't use the King James Version Bible, you get tricked into false doctrine, which leads you down a path of confusion and depression and salvation insecurity. Right division is key here, folks. I hope you can see that. So far, we've seen that we're not the bride. We're not the wife, not the woman, not the bridegroom. So what are we then? Who are we, you might be wondering? Well, let's find out. And the person that's going to tell us that is our Apostle Paul. Because the body of Christ is in Paul's books. So if we're asking questions about us today, we need to go to Paul's books. Romans through Philemon. That's it. If you're looking in the Old Testament, in the four Gospels, in the last books, if you're looking outside of Paul's books for answers to questions regarding us today, you're not going to find it. All right. What you're going to end up doing is looking at the nation of Israel, the Jews, thinking that you fit in that program when you don't. All right? You're reading their mail, not your mail. You're reading their mail and you're trying to apply their mail to you. And that's where all the tradition comes from. That's where the confusion comes from. That's not rightly dividing. That's not understanding who we are as the body of Christ today at all. If you look at Galatians 1, verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, 
how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews religion above many my equals in mine own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers but when it pleased God who separated me this is Paul speaking separated me from my mother's womb okay this is speaking of the nation of Israel here not his literal mother not his physical mother read 15 again but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal the son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus so here we see another example of, of Paul being born from the woman Israel he called her his mother right her, his mother's womb again this is the woman Israel first Corinthians 15 verse 6 after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep after that he was seen of James then of all the Apostles and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time there's again there's a hint to what he was talking about earlier about being born from his mother right God removed him from his mother's womb here Paul is explaining that born out of due time God removed him from the woman Israel the nation of Israel the laws he God removed him Paul from that womb that system and placed him into another program which we have today the body of Christ for I am the least of the Apostles that am not meet to be called an Apostle because I persecuted the Church of God so we see Paul clearly identifying Israel as being a woman here what about the body of Christ what does Paul identify us with today in the body of Christ well let's look at 1st Corinthians 3 9 for we are laborers together with God ye are God's husbandry ye are God's building in Romans 12 5 so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members uh, one of another first Corinthians 12 12 for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ this is speaking of us here this is Paul Paul's books okay first Corinthians 12 27 now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular first Corinthians 12 13 for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit Ephesians 3 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel Ephesians 4 4 there is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling Ephesians 4 12 for the perfecting of the Saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ Ephesians 5 23 for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body look at that closely again for the husband is the head of the wife and what comes next the simile right even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body that is not calling the body of Christ the wife of Christ right this is not calling the church the wife here read it again for the husband is the head of a wife right the a husband is the head of a wife even as Christ is the head of the church in that verse it is explaining the relationship between a husband and wife the husband being in charge of the wife even as Christ is in charge of the church nowhere in that verse is it calling us the bride the wife or any such thing again there's a simile in this verse even as that's why I said earlier it's extremely important to have a good grasp on English 
comp uh, you know, comprehension, really. First, uh, Ephesians 5.30, for we are members of what? His body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Again, he is Christ here, is the head of the body, that's us, the church. Okay? Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we might have the preeminence. Colossians 2.17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. You know, the sad truth is, making the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is to replace Israel with, the, with us, with the body of Christ. This is replacement theology 101. And if you follow the rabbit trail, all, you know, of re replacement theology, it's going to lead you way back to the origins of this heresy. In fact, you'll be led to the very beginning of Catholicism, straight to the Vatican. While doing research for this study, it led me to the Vatican's library of doctrine, the Catholic creed. Some call it the doctrinal statement today, right? And we're going to look at that, these documents here. Part one of this document, this is the catechism of the Catholic faith, the profession of faith. Quote, number 789, the comparison of the church with the body casts light on the intimate bond between Christ and his church. Not only is she gathered around him, she is united in him in his body. Three aspects of the church as the body of Christ are to be more specifically noted the unity of all her members with each other as a result of their union with Christ, Christ as the head of the body, and the church as bride of Christ. Keep in mind, this is the Vatican, Catholicism. This is coming out of their catechism. This is doctrine to them, okay? This is gold. This is what they, they base everything off of right here, right? So the next paragraph, quote, the title here, the church is the bride of Christ. Quote, the unity of Christ and the church, head and members of one body, also implies the distinction of the two within a personal relationship. This aspect is often expressed by the image of bridegroom and bride. The theme of Christ as bridegroom of the church was prepared for by the prophets and announced by John the Baptist. And that is a lie. That is a complete lie. The Lord referred to himself as the bridegroom. That is true. The apostle speaks of the whole church and of each of the faithful members of his body. As a bride betrothed to Christ the Lord so as to become but one spirit with him the church is the spotless bride of the spotless lamb. That is a lie. They're call what they're doing is they're calling the nation of Israel the church. Okay? And we know that's not it. In the book of Matthew, John the Baptist, during the four, in the four Gospels, we're only dealing with the nation of Israel in there. We're not dealing with the body of Christ in the Gospel for today because Paul didn't, didn't even exist at that point as a, an apostle for us. So, the Vatican is calling the, the church Israel. This is Replacement Theology 101 again. 237, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. He has joined her with himself in everlasting covenant and never stops caring for her as for his own body. Next paragraph, quote, This is the whole Christ, head and body, one formed by many, whether the head or member speak, it is Christ who speaks. He speaks in his role as the head, ex persona cap capitis, capitis, and in his role as body, ex persona corporis. What does this mean? 
the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. And the Lord himself says in the gospel, no, he doesn't. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. They are, in fact, two different persons. Yet they are one in the conjugal union. As head, he calls himself the bridegroom. As body, he calls himself the bride. Next paragraph, quote, number 808. The church is the bride of Christ. He loved her and handed himself over for her. He has purified her by his blood and made her the fruitful mother of all God's children. So that's the Vatican's catechism statement of faith. All right. Understand, this goes back to the early centuries. The Vatican started using the phrase bride of Christ. The body of Christ wasn't using it because they understood they weren't na the nation of Israel. It wasn't them doing it. The Vatican is the first one to use this Bride of Christ in relation to the body of Christ. What they, were, what they are doing is they're calling their church, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, they call that the Bride of Christ. So the phrase Bride of Christ is nothing new. And it's important to understand where it came from. It's not in the King James Version Bible, saints. This false teaching has been around for a very, very long time. And what happened is it slipped into the body of Christ and now it's believed as being true. When we see here in this study that it's everything but the truth. So let's move on to the secular definition of the bride of Christ. Let's see what the secular world has to say about this phrase, bride of Christ. What's amazing to me is that the secular world actually gets it right. And the church is being deceived into believing a lie. I mean, that just blows my mind how the secular community can actually get this right. Here in the New Word Encyclopedia, I looked up the phrase, Bride of Christ, and here is what I found. Quote, The term Bride of Christ is normally a metaphorical, metaphorical reference to the body of believers of the Christian church or ecclesia which means assembly although the term has several other meanings and has long been debated by judeo-christian scholars the reference originates listen 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 up folks the reference originates from the old testament prophets who described israel as god's bride how about that the secular world actually gets it correct. They go on to say, In the Roman Catholic Church, the image of the church as Christ's bride has also been connected or associated with nuns and consecrated virgins. A less common metaphorical expression is to be found in believers who report a mystical union with Jesus Christ. For others in history, the image has been described as a more personal, spiritual relationship with Jesus. Several examples include Anne Catherine, Emmerich, Joanna Southcott, Gertrude Morgan, Asa Waldau, Catherine of Alexandria, Catherine of Siena, and Catherine de Ricci. In addition, there is the idea of a literal physical bride of Jesus during the period of his ministry especially in the person of Mary Magdalene, with whom Jesus was said to have a child with. Wow! Although considered heresy within most of the Christianity, the suggestion of such a person has persisted recently being revived through contemporary interpretations of the legend of the Holy Grail. So the point is, is that in this secular encyclopedia, they actually define the Bride of Christ as originating from the Old Testament prophets calling Israel the wife of God, the Bride of God. In conclusion, number one, the King James Version Bible never once calls the Body of Christ the Bride of Christ. Number two, the term Bride of Christ is never used in Paul's 13 books, Romans through Philemon. And Paul's the only one that speaks about the body of Christ. And number three, the only time Paul speaks about husbands and wives 
in relation to Christ Jesus and the body of Christ is when Paul uses similes to illustrate the purity relationship and how we're no longer under the law today in Christ Jesus. Number four, the Old Testament explains in detail that the relationship between God and Israel is as a, is a husband wife relationship. That Israel is the woman, the wife who God divorced because of her unfaithfulness and reckon and will reconcile with her at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number 5, the four gospels reveal who the bridegroom is, who the wife is, pointing once again at the nation of Israel, the Jews, Jerusalem. Number six, the last book of the Bible, more so at the end of Revelation, we see again who the woman is, the bride, once again pointing to the twelve tribes of Israel, the new Jerusalem. Number seven, we saw where the term bride of Christ was first ori was originated, where it was used by the Vatican, making them the wife of God. Major blasphemy. Number eight, we saw the secular world's definition of the bride of Christ. Even they know it comes from the Old Testament relationship between God and Israel. Number nine, we saw how making the body of Christ and Israel the bride of Christ leads to the teaching of replacement theology, trying to destroy the true identity of the Jews and their relationship with our Lord God. And number ten, we saw how not rightly dividing God's word leads to false teaching, traditions of men, and many more denominations and religions to deceive mankind. So, the question is, are you going to believe another gospel created by tradition? Or are you going to stick to your guns and make God your final authority? The choice is yours. According to Revelation 21, verses 9 and 10, the Lamb's wife is the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, Israel's redeemed capital city and her promised land which will come down from heaven and land on the earth. It is the nation of Israel, Jerusalem. By marrying the nation of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament, will marry himself to her land, the promised land, the new Jerusalem. These are the concepts being addressed in Revelation chapters 19 and 21. We can either believe the testimony of scriptures or we can continue with church tradition. I prefer to believe God and let traditions of men be found liars. What about you? Will you stand on God's word as being perfect or are you going to let the enemy lead you astray? The choice is up to you. Now, I'm leaving our next study open to your suggestions so please please leave leave a comment below okay on a subject that you want to study more and what I'll do is I'll take the most suggested topics and I'll run with that alright so I'm gonna leave our next video our next study the topic of it all up to you so right something in the comment section something that you've always wanted to study something that you're not familiar with something that's confusing you something that you know needs to be addressed and I'll do my best to do that all right so thanks for studying with me saints lord willing i shall see you on the next study